we are into our final session of the day, which is uh, on maritime rules, which means uh, what we mean to say in this is that uh, maritime issues are, are the cornerstone of this whole Indo-Pacific concept. And uh, we have two eminent uh, presenters of this pro pro proposition from two different points of view, maybe, or geographically, at least, they are located two different uh, areas. They occupy two different areas, Dr. Jeffrey Becker um, in from Washington and uh, Dr. Connie Rahakundini Bakri from Indonesia. So without uh, any further ado, I will now go to Dr. Becker. Dr. Becker um, is the uh, is the program director for the CN for CNA's Indo-Pacific Securities Affairs Program, where he, um, he overs at the Indo-Pacific Security Affairs uh, uh, director Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Center for Naval Analysis, George Washington University, Washington D.C. in the United States, where it is very very early at the moment. Um, so I'm happy that he's bright and cheerful. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Becker oversees the uh, CNA, CNA's Indo-Pacific Securities Affairs Program, uh, work examining defense plans and policies, security trends, other issues of importance to the US Navy and Department of Defense, uh, which are related to allies, partners, and non-state actors across the Indo-Pacific region. Dr. Becker has testified before Congress, briefed the US government and Department of Defense officials, and written extensively on uh, China's military as a global force, including the PLA's overseas uh, basing or activities, US-China military engagement, and the security implications of China's global presence. From 2014 to 2018, Dr. Becker supported the US Navy with regard to China's uh, participation in the multilateral Rim of the Pacific exercise, RIMPAC, working alongside US and Chinese exercise planners and spending time abroad, multiple PLA Navy ships during the exercise. Dr. P Becker's publications include Peasants to Protesters, Social Ties to Resources and Migrant Labor Contention in Contemporary China. Uh, published by Lexington Books 2014, and China's presence in the Middle East and Western Indian Ocean beyond Belt and Road. Um, it's CNA 2019. His forthcoming publications include Sea Foam in the Ocean or an Asian NATO, um, China's views on the squad and securing China's oh. lifelines. PL, PLA Navy presence in the Indian Ocean region um, with the US Navy War College and other peer reviewed writings have appeared in Contemporary Political Studies, Journal of Chinese Political Science, and Naval War College Review. So it's a wide spectrum you cover and seeming to reconcile irreconcilable opposites, I feel, Dr. Becker. So we leave you to shed light on. Uh, America and especially what we would like to say here, um, how things will pan out when the administrations change in Washington. Excellent. Well, thank thank you very much for that that introduction. Um, and first of all, I'd like to express my my thanks and my appreciation to the Global Dialogue Forum and to Mr. Manaharan for for the opportunity to participate in the summit today. So. As was just mentioned, uh, I direct the Indo-Pacific Affairs Program at the Center for Naval Analysis based just outside Washington, D.C. in Arlington, Virginia. And by way of background, we are what's known as a uh, federally funded research and development center, an FFRDC for short. So we're civilian researchers that conduct analysis on behalf of the United States Navy and the U.S. Department of Defense. And before I begin, I should just note that the views I share today are strictly my own. They're not the views of the Center for Naval Analysis, the Department of Defense, or the United States Navy. So with that in mind, it is my view that the summit we're having today is very well-timed. It's coming on the heels of recently concluded US presidential elections, and President-elect Biden's foreign policy team is now taking shape. 
Uh, this new administration will follow one that have a heavy, heavy focus on the Indo-Pacific region, uh, at least in rhetoric, if not always in policy implementation. And you can see this focus on the Indo-Pacific through a number of Trump administration publications. The U.S. Department of Defense Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, for example, describes the Indo-Pacific as the department's priority theater and the single most consequential region for America's future. Uh, the message had been echoed by a number of other administration publications, the 2017 National Security Strategy, for example, or the United States Department of Defense Free and Open, excuse me, the State Department's Free and Open Indo-Pacific Report. At the same time, we've seen a strengthening of U.S.-India relations as well, particularly security ties between the two nations. Uh, a detailed examination of the factors that lead to this growing security relationship. This is beyond the scope of the time I have in the, in the talk today. Um, but suffice to say here that this development did not begin with the Trump administration. And the factors that helped to promote growing security ties between the United States and India to include not just the rise of China, for example, but the growing realization that two of the world's most influential democracies will need to work together with other like-minded democracies in the region in a post-COVID environment. And I think these factors will remain a fixture for quite some time, in my opinion, in the relationship. But as we all know, as part of this growing security cooperation, in October of this year, the United States and India, they signed the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement, the BECA Agreement for Geospatial Intelligence. And I was asked today to talk a little bit about the impact of some of these foundational agreements on U.S.-India relations. And I think this agreement will enable sharing of a wide range of geospatial products. This will include access to mapping and hydrographic data, flight information, and the U.S. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Geospatial Information Bank. So this BECA agreement now stands alongside two other fundamental U.S.-India security cooperation agreements. The Logistics Exchange Memorandum Agreement, the LAMOA Agreement, which, as we all know, was signed back in 2016. And this allows the United States and India to enable deployed forces to share logistics support. And then the Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement, the COMCASA Agreement, which allows for the transfer of communication security systems, such as Centrix terminals, which enable secure communications between the two nations. So together, the signing of these three agreements they represent a significant step in the advancement of U.S.-India security cooperation. But I think just as important as what these foundational agreements will do for the U.S.-India relationship, I think it's equally important to be very explicit and to understand what these agreements do not do and what they do not obligate the two countries to do. So, for example, since at least the Obama administration, when the first of these agreements were signed, one of the chief concerns was that these agreements could potentially imperil India's long-held foreign policy strategy of strategic autonomy, perhaps by paving the way for U.S. bases on Indian soil, for example, or perhaps binding India to U.S. systems and procedures. However, that's, that's not what these agreements are about. The United States has similar agreements with other states that value their autonomy in a manner similar to India, Indonesia, for example, and South Africa. Moreover, there's nothing in any of these agreements that would provide basing rights to the United States or to force India to rely solely on the United States for any military or telecommunications equipment. These three agreements, the Lamoa Agreement, Comcasa, and the Becca Agreements, they merely provide the legal framework for the transfer of logistical supplies, the transfer of communication security systems, and the transfer of geospatial data, respectively. They don't require India to obtain these items or systems from the United States. Some have also expressed concern over the years that these foundational agreements um, may involve data sharing that could reveal the location of Indian military assets to Pakistan or other third parties, for example. But that's not a concern either, in my opinion, because as the United States shares these, this data, data feeds can and often become modified such that the U.S. restricts access to different types of data for different countries so that India's data could not be shared with other countries despite sharing common hardware and platforms. However, if, if that's what these agreements don't do, what I, what I believe that they do do is advance this security relationship between the two countries into new territory. They allow U.S. and Indian, and Indian naval ships to coordinate on logistics operations. They improve the ability of the two sides to engage in secure communications. And they improve India's access to a wider array, array of geospatial data. So together, I believe that these agreements will improve communication, coordination, and interoperability between the armed forces of the two nations. 
So on balance, I believe the signing of these agreements represents a significant step forward in the security relationship between the two countries. And I think this naturally raises two questions. Uh, number one, why now? Why did we sign these agreements? Why did we come to fruition and come to completion on these three foundational agreements after such a long process, process of negotiation? And number two, what does the future relationship look like under a Biden administration? And what does the U.S. approach to the Indo-Pacific region look like more broadly as a whole? So with regard to this first question, I think it's clear that as a region, the Indo-Pacific and the Indian Ocean more specifically has only grown in terms of its geostrategic importance. And I think it continues to do so. The region remains a driver of the world's economic growth and hopefully will continue to do so in a post-COVID environment. It's currently home to four of the world's five largest economies, the United States, China, Japan, and India, as well as many of the world's fastest growing economies. It's home to roughly 60% of the world's population. It serves to connect East and West through some of the world's most critical sea lanes of communication and key choke points. So with the rise of, of India, as India's growing importance in the region, and India's increasingly important role as a provider of security and stability, and in all likelihood, an engine of economic growth in a post-COVID Indo-Pacific, I think increased collaboration between the United States and one of the region's most consequential nations just makes sense. Another key factor, however, has obviously been the rise of China and China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean and indeed throughout the Indo-Pacific. And I think nothing looms larger than China's growing maritime presence. And coming from the Center for Naval Analysis, this is an area obviously that is of, of critical importance to me. Uh, and we, we've been paying attention to the expansion of PLA Navy activities, not just in the Indian Ocean, but in Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, and other locations throughout the Indo-Pacific. In the Indian Ocean, for example, we're all familiar with the common milestones discussed when we talk about China's growing maritime presence in this region. It began with China's counter piracy operations and contribu contribution to counter piracy operations in um, the off the Horn of Africa in the Gulf of Aden, and then began to expand with routine submarine patrols beginning as early as 2013. Then we had the establishment of China's first ever overseas base in Djibouti in 2017. We have a growing number of training activities in the region for the PLA Navy, and then numerous research vessels conducting out of area operations, and many other examples. Meanwhile, just outside the Indian Ocean across the Malacca Strait in Southeast Asia, we see continued indications that China is establishing a military presence at Reem Naval Base in Cambodia. And although Cambodia is located about 650, 700 miles from the eastern entrance of the Malacca Strait, the, the gateway to the Andaman Sea in the eastern Indian Ocean, depending on what the PLA Navy or the PLA Air Force would be able to deploy there, a military presence at Sinukville would certainly improve China's maritime domain awareness in the eastern entrance of that, of that strait. And it would help to address some of the critical anti-air and possibly anti-submarine challenges that the PLA Navy now faces. And if we talk for a second about a broader maritime presence, I think nothing looms larger than China's Maritime Silk Road project, which is Xi Jinping's flagship pro program, which was designed to better connect China with other regions of the world, primarily through, primarily through infrastructure connectivity. And in the maritime economy, for the Indian Ocean particularly, this means investments not only in regional port infrastructure, but in the telecommunications, in the pipelines, in the undersea cables and communication infrastructure in the region as well. Therefore, in addition to the growth of China's naval presence throughout the Indian Ocean, and indeed the Indo-Pacific region more broadly, we see China's maritime presence ex broadly defined to include its maritime economic presence can create cause for concern. It's important to note, however, that I don't think it would be fair to say that this growth in U.S.-India relations is all about China. I think that as we see continued growth and development of India, the United States and India have been coming together to address a number of common challenges in the region. And this would include challenges such as violent extremism, drug trafficking and human trafficking, and addressing cyber crimes, and obviously a response to the COVID pandemic. And although we've seen some awkward moments in, in regards to the U.S.-India trade relationship under the Trump administration, it's clear that the two countries have a robust and a growing economic relationship. Indeed, I think the U.S. has overtaken China as India's largest trade partner. And while India holds a substantial trade deficit with China, I think to the tune of roughly uh, four and a half to five billion uh, U.S. dollars in 2019, the U.S. is one of the few countries with which India has a trade surplus. 
Moreover, I see the incoming Biden administration has already signaled a commitment to addressing environmental issues and climate change. And I think this creates new opportunities for the United States and India to work together on this common set of challenges. So while the rise of China as a power in the Indo-Pacific and in the Indian Ocean uh, looms very large in this relationship, I think it's by no means the only factor that brings the United States and India together at this time. Indeed, I think that we do see a natural affinity for democracies to work together. And I believe that's long overdue. And I think it's reflected in India's growing relationship with not just the United States, but other like-minded democracies in the region, such as Australia and Japan, as well as in the form of the quadrilateral, quadrilateral excuse me, the quad, the quadrilateral security dialogue, which brings all four democracies, the United States, India, Japan, and Australia together. So with the signing of these agreements and a discussion of the factors that have been shaping this growth in U.S.-India relations, what might we see in terms of the U.S. approach to the region under a Biden administration? So in the remaining time that I have, I want to touch upon this issue both at a broad strategic level in terms of how the new administration might view the region, and then at a more detailed level in terms of how these three foundational agreements, which we initially discussed, might affect future security cooperation between the U.S. and India. So in terms of the incoming administration's strategic approach to the Indo-Pacific, to be very clear, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't, I, I, I don't have any, any special knowledge of this, but I do think that there are a few, a few structural factors that will help to preserve continuity from one administration to the next. I think the most important are, first, the continued competition between the United States and China, and second, the continued importance of the Indo-Pacific and growing security ties between the United States and India. So first, U.S. and China relations. I think it's important to remember that the current downturn we see in the U.S.-China relationship is not simply a function of the Trump administration. This relationship between the two countries has been deteriorating to, for about a decade or so. We see rising tensions in, in the relationship between the two countries for quite a while. It didn't, it didn't begin under the Trump administration in January 2017, nor did it begin with the Trump administration's national security strategy. My personal opinion is that by the time of the second Obama administration in 2012, I believe there was a consensus both inside the U.S. government and in parts of the U.S. business com community and elsewhere in U.S. society that U.S. policy towards China needed to be recal recalibrated slightly based on a growing concern about some PRC policies. And while it's true that tensions and problems in the relationship has accelerated over the past couple of years, and I think COVID has made, made the issue much worse, it took at least a decade for the United States and China to get where they are in this stage of the relationship. And I don't think there will be an easy fix here for some time. I think that competition between the United States and China will last for quite some time. And I think the nature and the characteristics, characteristics of that competition might change, but I think competition will be a fundamental issue. I also believe it's critical to understand how the Biden, Biden administration might approach the region. As I said, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't have any special knowledge about how the U.S. will approach the region in the coming years, but I do believe that the U.S. will continue to support a rules-based regional order in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And it's going to be one that's based on promoting rule of law, freedom of navigation and free trade, and other shared norms. I think that barring a fundamental shift in PRC foreign policy, it appears that competition, as I said, between the U.S. and China will be a fixture of U.S. policy in the region for quite some time, although the characteristics of that may change. Second, as I mentioned before, we have a growing importance of the Indo-Pacific and indeed the Indian Ocean as a driver of global growth, but also as a location of geostrategic importance, as a conduit connecting other regions of the world, and hopefully as a source for solutions to addressing some of the common challenges that we face, such as climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic and perhaps the rise of other pandemics in the future. So I see this region as a source of solutions as well. Turning more to specifics with regard to the U.S.-India foundational agreements and how those might affect U.S.-India relations in the future, where do we go from here in terms of cooperation on that front? I think that in the past, the absence of these foundational agreements, such as Comcasa and Becca, I think this has affected the functionality of U.S. platforms that have been sold to India, such as P-81 aircraft, for example. And I think it's limited the interoperability and data sharing opportunities between the two militaries. But now many of these issues have been resolved in theory, if not yet executed in practice. And I think going forward, some of the expectations of the United States policy in this region 
will likely be to build upon these foundations in conjunction and in cooperation with the government of India. For instance, how do these foundational agreements get exercised in practice? Some are further along than this, obviously, than others. Uh, the Lomoa Pact, for example, signed in 2016, this has provided years of opportunities for the United States and India to cooperate on logistics activities. And I believe both sides are increasingly comfortable executing these types of operations with each other. And we have many such, exam many such examples. And in September of this year, we saw the INS Telwar conduct replenishment of sea operations with the UNS, UNNS Yukon in the Northern Arabian Sea. More recently, we've seen a number of different logistics interoperability exercises as part of Malabar 2020. And all of this helps to improve logistics interoperability among US and Indian uh, Navy participants, and perhaps among all members of the Quad in the future. So more on this front needs to be done, obviously. But I think we can also expand this level of cooperation out to other like-minded states in the region. With regard to the Comcasa agreement, I think that both the US and India have made good progress on this front as well. But I think more needs to be done to provide India and particularly the Indian Navy with access to communications platforms that are necessary to make the most of this agreement on a day-to-day -day and routine basis, as opposed to making it a unique or, or specific event. And just to provide one example, I think more centric terminals, for example, on the Indian Navy ships, this would allow the two navies to execute safe and secure communications on a more routine basis. With regards to the Becca agreement, I think it may be too soon to tell, but as India and the United States become more comfortable cooperating in the information domain, this potentially provides India with the ability to obtain more lead time and, on, and more intelligence on imminent threats, including imminent uh, terrorist threats. It may increase India's maritime domain awareness in the region. Therefore, it might allow India to better track and monitor competitor platforms, such as PLA, PLA Navy submarines that are now operating in the Indian Ocean with greater frequency. And it can improve the utility and accuracy, perhaps for long range weapon systems that India has. However, and I'm sure other participants here can speak to this with a much higher degree of detailed knowledge than I can. But now that these agreements have been signed, my question is how do they become operationalized in the future? And perhaps thinking more broadly, now that we have these building blocks in the relationship, both in terms of the foundational agreements as well as the growing momentum in US India relations, how do we build upon this from here? And just my personal view, I think three baskets of issues stand out in my mind. The first is helping to promote and advance the shared understanding of a free and open Indo-Pacific, which rests upon a rules-based regional order that promotes rule of law, freedom of navigation, free trade, and other shared norms. Second would be building upon some of the progress that we've seen in terms of logistics interoperability and information sharing in order to improve maritime domain awareness in the region. And I think this might include cooperation, not just between the US and India, but perhaps between other like-minded democracies in the form of quad members on issues, as I mentioned, such as tracking PLA Navy assets, transiting through key slocks, or coordinating among quad members in terms of helping other states in the region, in the Indian Ocean, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, expand and improve their own maritime domain awareness capabilities. And third, expanding out what we mean by the maritime domain, for example, for a moment. The growth in quad cooperation, I think it provides an excellent opportunity for countries in the region to work together to promote economic growth in the region that's transparent, that's sustainable, and that promotes economic development for countries in the region in which that investment is occurring. So in doing so, I think this would provide a useful alternative to some of the more negative aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative, China's flagship program, which at times and in certain countries has facilitated corruption, led to unsustainable debt ratios, and has simply failed to produce expected rates of return on investments. So alternatives such as the Blue Dot Network, which seeks to improve the level of transparency in infrastructure investments, or the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility, which when working alongside the United States, Japan, and India could provide financing tools for projects. I think these are all good starts in this regard. So in short, I think the region as a whole, led by the US-India relationship, Coupled with the quad arrangement of democracies, this could be well positioned to advance a number of shared goals, ranging from supporting shared norms and values, improving practical interoperability among like-minded militaries and navies, and even offering more robust alternatives to PRC investments, thus advancing growth and development in the region. And I'll end there. So thank you very much for your time. So now we will uh, invite Dr. Con Connie Bakri to 
address this gathering, uh, virtual gathering. She lectures, Dr. Connie Buck lectures at the Faculty of Postgraduate Studies at the University of Indonesia, which is the preeminent university of Indonesia, as Mr. Remini knows very well, um, and uh, Universitas Nacional and some other equally eminent institutions. She is a defense analyst and author of two uh, notable books on Indonesia's military and defense. She is a visiting lecturer at the Navy and Air Force uh, Command Colleges and at uh, University, Universitas Pertahanan, Indonesia's National Defense University, and um, also at, an, at institutions run by Indonesia's Ministry for Foreign Affairs. She has also lectured overseas in Washington, D.C., in Brussels for the ASM uh, EU Regional Security Architecture and the Geneva Center for Security Policy in Switzerland and the Department of Defense uh, in the U.K. She is also a research fellow at the Institute of Natural Security Studies in Tel Aviv, Israel. She is an executive director of IODAS, Institute of Defense and Security Studies, and uh, with Ambassador Hashim Jalal and Admiral Kent Sondak, uh, where she sits with them on the board uh, of trustees at the Indonesian Maritime Studies, Inst Indonesian Institute for Maritime Studies. She is also a graduate of the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii. She is now engaged with the ASEAN political and security community, the maritime security, regional security architecture, and in analyzing the sea lanes of communication, um, emphasizing on the importance and strategic aspects of regional equilibrium. So I think she will speak on uh, the balance of power in the Indo region, with uh, Indonesia being the central geographical center or in any strategy uh, uh, confabulation or in uh, Indo-Pacific. So over to you, um, Dr. Kunibak. Thank you so much, Pak Monahalan. Uh, uh, hello, Pak Jeffrey and uh, Pak Peter. Uh, first, I, to, I would like to thank you for the Global Malta uh, Forum and the Conrad Adenauer Stiftum for this opportunity. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation just now that I heard. And I think uh, my, 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 my piece of mind that I'm going to discuss today is about how the global domination uh, uh, situations in our region and how the regional country actually should rule a safety, a peace, prosper in the Pacific. The things why I, why I have to mention this one, because as um, Mr. Baker just uh, said just now, it's really emphasizing on what and how actually India involved on that. So, um, well, uh, but with the background that we are the non climate countries, then I have to be very uh, balanced of saying things uh, regarding the, the rise of China. Uh, sometimes I wonder why China is become so powerful, and where where did where did China learn this kind of things? First, I thought is maybe it's learning from what the United States did. I mean, for the past uh, past uh, several years. I mean, but again, China is uh, actually a global maritime. Um, uh, uh, what, a global maritime power since the maybe 400,000 BC. So again, but okay, I'm not going to talk about the war history, but again, the, since the beginning of time, it's really clear that the, that a cheaper move to uh, the cheaper way to move goods by water is by uh, 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 is more cheaper by water instead of by land. And control of the sea therefore give a nation strength hold over the leave of people that border on it. So the main purpose of the sea power has always been to protect a friendly shipping from enemy attack or to destroy or hinder the enemy shipping, which is, of course, with uh, commercial or military. And naval forces have also been used to bombard land objectives from the sea. I think whoever rules the wave, rules the world by Mahan is really believed by, by uh, some uh, maritime uh, nation, including uh, China. Uh, perhaps uh, China uh, learning from Britain as well, which is uh, in the 18th and uh, 19th century, Britain rose the uh, position which is controlled the world oceans and the political, linguistic, cultural and social complexion of the world today, I think is all a huge amount to the activities of the Royal Navy from the 16th century onward. By the 18th century, Britain has established a naval hegemony, which is remained for the uh, unsecond, unsecond until uh, 1920s. 
Uh, it was used to believe that actually British success was a product simply of the aggressive spirit. But I think it wasn't. It was because the British paid for more ships and more guns than anyone else. And I think this is what China really copied. British, uh, what British uh, own like more ships and more guns is exactly what China did today. By the early 18th century, the British people had come to believe passionately that the best defense of their life, liberty and religions, is actually the surest way of making money lay at the sea. I think China think that way again, you know. Uh, so actually, uh, during that time, money was made uh, available to maintain ship, dry docks, port and foundries, and Britain technological lead. Uh, the Navy enjoyed an increasing quality advantage over, over her enemy, uh, over her uh, enemies for nearly 200 years. Now the continental and maritime Indo-Pacific. US and China engaged in their uh, uh, order to building project continue, uh, continent, uh, continental and maritime Indo-Pacific, the central theater of the uh, greater power rivalry. And not just compromising a core strategic China Belt and Road Initiative in the 21st century, Maritime Silk Road, ASEAN Centrality constitute the key anchor in the free and open Indo-Pacific, which is uh, uh, FOIP strategy. And the region is actually the hotbed of the competing infrastructures, uh, uh, financing project, which is high-speed rail, uh, mentioned just now uh, by Mr. Baker more uh, precisely on strategic port building as well. The region will be uh, especially critical uh, for uh, Japan, India, Australia, supply chain resilience. And not just a geoeconomic, but the contested waters of the South China Sea is actually a major frost press point because Beijing invested uh, in uh, advancing maritime order uh, founded on Chinese historical representation of the sea. Beijing has its own uh, plus one strategy, I may call it, as a, a, a trade and technology wars are estimated increased investment and, uh, in the international circulations. So now talking about pe uh, people of Liberation Army Navy, it's a modern, it's it's a modernizing and in impressive freight. You know, a key ingredient is the construction of fleet of large large destroyers, amphibious warships, and aircraft carriers. And China has already two carrier services, but uh, I think uh, we are going to expect a significantly uh, significantly a new one, different one, which is known as the Type 003. There are many CPRs across China, which is uh, similarly impressive, which is, uh, uh, that's why is uh, China Navy today is uh, maybe, in the, or in the future, is really uh, beyond uh, what we call as the Chinese Navy on the past uh, or on the history. So, so what I'm going to say is the world today, uh, in, especially in this region, has a very big NAFA balance is uh, uh, shifting. Uh, China understands maritime influence in the same way, I think, about Mahan in the 19th century American strategies, control of the sea. Now, I think China already rode the wave. Uh, five of the top container ports in the world are in mainland China. In terms of container ports, China already rose the wave. Nearly two-thirds of the uh, world top 50 had China's investment since 2015. And those ports handle about 67% of global container volumes. Of the top uh, port operators worldwide, China company handled 39% of it. And I think this, uh, I've, I've got the information from the Lloyd List Intelligence. And the fishing armada numbers is 200,000 sea going vessel. China dual, dual use commercial and naval port. This is uh, an inherent duality in the facilities that China is establishing in foreign ports, which is, which is ostensibly commercial, but quickly could be upgradable to carry out essential military. Uh, Abhijit Singh, the observer of Research Foundation in New Delhi, stated that they are great for the soft projection of hard power of China. Uh, the China already knows the wave as well because of three points. First is dozen of small harbors, which is uh, mentioned just now by Dr. Bok, uh, Becker, including some uh, strategic locations, Djibouti, uh, Hamban Tota in Sri Lanka, Darwin, Australia, and uh, uh, Mede in uh, Myanmar. And of course, the proposed port on the Atlantic Ocean Island. And since 2010, China have completed announced deal involving 44, maybe 40 port projects. I think total is about 45 billion. And a dozen other deals, which is uh, Kerry Island, uh, Malaysia, uh, Chongji, North Korea, and uh, some other thing is reported by some bits and in the, from the uh, King's College London. In the Chinese context, maritime power encompasses more than naval power. The maritime power uh, equation includes a large and effective coast guard, 
a world-class merchant marine and fishing fleet and global recognized shipbuilding capacity, as I mentioned before. And this is uh, written by uh, Michael David, a senior fellow at CNA Strategic Studies. Uh, at 2015, actually, uh, China started a uh, paper, a semi-official journal, uh, which is uh, of uh, China's Academic of Science, uh, calling China to make full of uh, full use of diplomatic and economic methods to establish a strategic maritime location point for resupply and military bases to so as to protect strategic maritime uh, passes. Now, talking about the United States, United States vision for the Indo-Pacific, just now uh, mentioned by Dr. Baker, is actually emphasizing our, our uh, effort uh, focus on the three pillars, uh, economic, uh, governance, and security. And this built on principles of ensuring the freedom of Australian navigations and the skies, I add the skies here, insulting sovereign nation, uh, in, uh, nation from external coercion, promoting market-based economic, which is a fair, fair trade, and supporting good governance and respect for individual rights. Trump fundamentally changed U.S. policy on China by acting on his uh, campaign pledge to treat Beijing as a strategic uh, rival and threat, which is replaced Barack Obama pivot to Asia with the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. So Joe Biden has declared U.S. president elected, elected but the fate of many policies under Trump pres uh, presidency remains undecided, uh, especially on the base of uh, the, the new uh, cabinet, I call that the cabinet of Biden that's going to be uh, formed. The Quad itself is originally 2007-2018 uh, uh, quadrilateral security dialogue rebranded by uh, uh, rebranded to by the U.S., Australia, India, and Japan consultations, and many proponents of the Quad consider the fledging alliances with the potential uh, to uh, form the nucleus of an ASEAN NATO, which is contain China. China foreign ministry view uh, uh, Quad as anti-China frontline. India is one of the cornerstone of the non-alignment movement, but it hedging its bets because it has rammed uh, purchase of US, U.S. military hardware, but uh, stake on modernization of its air force on the French Rafale jet, and paying Russia uh, expand uh, existing fleet of uh, MiG and Sukhoi, which is uh, asked Russia as well to expedite in delivery of the S-14 air defense system on 2018. It's also developing the increasingly close defense, uh, defense ties with the another non aligned regional giant, which is Indonesia. And Australia and Japan already operate many U.S. military hardware, of course, and uh, to ensure both uh, interoperability among their armed forces. Both also have a long time alliances treaty with the United States. So for the U.S., Australia and Japan, the quote is uh, really super flows. The quote is beginning to take concrete shape is respond to China muscular foreign policy. China expansionism has driven technology shift in India's security calculus, which is leading to closer defense intelligence sharing uh, collaboration with the United States and the signing of military logistic agreement with Japan and Australia, which is mentioned before. The Trump administration helped midwife this technology shift by placing India at the center of Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is very uh, uh, something to Indonesia because we are placing our position as, as in, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific defense fulcrum or world defense fulcrum. And uh, seeking a force, a soft alliance with New Delhi. Other countries is very uh, deep, you know. Uh, U.S. step to strengthen strengthening India is increasing investment in super and hypersonic uh, ship missile, along with investment in maritime domain awareness, uh, ISR as well, acquiring more submarines, improving military transportation infrastructure, and consolidating aircraft procurement, uh, making commercial space system and partnering with other space uh, space faring nation. And toward multi domain and operation comprise, uh, comprising long range fires, electronic warfare, cyber warfare, and anti maritime, anti art engineering and information operations. Biden and maritime security initiative. I think Biden seems will be expanding foreign military financing to Indo Pacific countries and continue funding the maritime security initiative, which is guard against expanding MSI authorities to other countries. Uh, explicitly, explicitly direct uh, this effort to focus on creating common operational pictures. And the shared nature of the system will provide with the measure of strategic resilience, protection, sensitive intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance collection capabilities, which is uh, could be tiered with the lowest one, uh, sharing basic civilian airspace and maritime awareness, but at the second tier could be incorporated on less sensitive military ISR data. U.S. Indo-Pacific combat uh, credible posture. Uh, talking about this one is actually is adopting, exercising, demonstration, and the ability to execute more dispersed basic posture. Acquiring equipment and maintainer personnel uh, to support a rapid uh, movement basis. 
renewing and fully supporting the compact of free association with the, with the federal state of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands and Palau, access to critical uh, geography, and developing support infrastructure and greater access to existing airfield. Improving runway and infrastructure as well for the compact of free association state, which is Palau and Yam. So uh, I think talking about the, the, the how to balance this, uh, this competition of, this, of, of the power uh, in this region, we have to look at our position with this, this, this situation. First, this kind of ships we are going to build and the way in which we play will be heavily independent, dependent upon what dominions our nation has and its location. And of course, I'm talking about this here is about the ASEAN countries. If we see the US and China capabilities in 2000, 2015 is still uh, almost, you know, around 2000, uh, United States still leading. But 2016, uh, China is already trying to catch that. On 2030, uh, from the data that we have, actually, China will really more uh, powerful than uh, United States. So what we need, perhaps, the new way of war. Uh, that not, not we need. Perhaps that's what we're going to see is the new way of war. By 2030, in certain scenario, the military of balance may already disadvantage the United States. China military strategy has been predominantly asymmetric, uh, seeking to disrupt, disable, or destroy critical systems that enable U.S. military advantage. And the U.S. Defense Department should revise its uh, requirement, programming, and budgeting and acquisition process to support and access the latest technological innovations because U.S. air bases, aircraft carriers, and surface vessel too vulnerable to Chinese air, air and missile air, uh, attacks. Uh, current U.S. Uh, uh, system for command control, communication, computer, uh, uh, C4, ISR, is actually uh, brittle in the face of Chinese uh, cyber attack, uh, electronic warfare, and long-range uh, strike. U.S. logistics logis system on ports and airfield uh, is very vulnerable to cyber and disruption and or, on physical attack as well. This all shortcoming must be addressed with, uh, with a very uh, considerable focus on your urgency. Uh, now talking about ASEAN, cooperation with partner countries and regional institutions such as ASEAN it should be the center actually of our approach. The Indo-Pacific is not a concept unique to the United States, but is shared by many nations in this region, especially ASEAN as well. ASEAN outlook of Indo-Pacific is a commitment of ASEAN countries to create Indo-Pacific region, region which is theater of cooperation and not theater of competition and rivalry. And I think this is what we should underline. So what ASEAN political security pillars should underline? I think, but, uh, or besides this, uh, another two pillars, the political and poli uh, 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 security pillar is the one that really uh, uh, still untouched, uh, you know. Uh, so we have to underline the NAFA strategy is a built strategy. A change is constant. Look at the Navy map of the region. Uh, and we have to believe that the sooner of the, uh, the better when, when we are having ships building sooner rather than later is generally uh, better. And having ship overseas is very important as well between ASEAN countries. Indonesia desire to protect sea lines and support free time maritime operation, which is evident by its pursuit of the global maritime food provision, uh, which is declared by President Jokowi on 2014, is actually motivated by regional uncertainty. Indonesia should deepening a bilateral cooperation in new policy frontiers, which is maritime space, air defense, air defense zone, and outer space. Uh, of course, cyberspace, digital infrastructure, investment, defense innovations, uh, advanced military technology, and including unmanned system. And this is very hard to Indonesia because of our non-alignment position. We really have to divide between coalition or the, uh, coalition of the, uh, the willing countries versus the coalition of the non-willing countries that we are going to uh, in forfeit. Shifting Indonesia army away from mass territorial defense toward multi-domain operations comprising long-range fires, electronic warfare, cyber warfare, uh, uh, anti-maritime, anti-R engineering and information operations perhaps is going to be taken by Indonesia. It's like uh, copying what uh, actually US do for India or US push India to do it. Indonesian military procurement, if we can go back uh, on the block affiliation, it's actually between 1950 to 1963, our block is more to the eastern uh, countries, more, almost 99%. But from 66 to 1998, our uh, procurement block more to the western countries is uh, about 97%, which is uh, the 3% get it from the non-alignment movement countries. Today, 1999 to 2020, our procurement and block affiliation is to Western countries is 77 percent, 
to Eastern countries is 21%, and to the non-alignment movement countries only 2%. This is going to, uh, I have to describe this one because it's going to, to picture what is the next uh, future, the procurement and uh, uh, system that we are going to have. So Indonesia non-alignment position have risen to be alarmed as the US and China continue their battle for global influence across different economic polit political spheres, including high profile air and naval exercises in the South China Sea, which is uh, in front of our eyes. So I think uh, our homework, our biggest homework is actually to balance the coalition of the willing uh, and coalition of the non-willing uh, autonomy in Indonesia on the post-2020 non-alignment concept. What is that? Uh, I think I proposed uh, the other opportunity with the Global Forum I already mentioned. We, uh, uh, Indonesia is very huge. I think we, we better dis divide Indonesia to the fourth uh, armada, which is for the certain fleet and the for Western Armada, which uh, the, uh, then we are going to cooperate with the, with the, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, on the Southern Fleet Armada, which is uh, on the uh, Pacific and the Eastern Armada, we are go going to, uh, to, we have to go with the coalition of the within countries, but lead by the Australians, not by the US, because Australia is our neighbor country. <laughs> and for the Southern Armada, which is in the Ocean and the Malacca uh, in the Western Armada, it has to be worked uh, or maybe uh, closer with the coalition or the non-willing nation, which is, of course, China and others. And what is the, we have to do is actually improve uh, improving the resilience of C4 ISR. This is actually uh, really looking for the how U.S. doing it. I mean, architecture in the face to uh, the C4 ISR architecture is in the face to attack might be the single most effective step to Indonesia. The, uh, the can take to strengthen its conventional, uh, conventional deterrent. Alternative, uh, alternative to space for ISR, long range communications and position in navigation and timing, which is PNT, and then low probability of uh, intercept and low probability of jamming data links. Uh, cyber protection that uh, prioritize on sufficient trust in data over protecting network integrity and a sophisticated surveillance system that can penetrate contested environment using speed or stealth to surveil critical targets. Uh, I'm going to, to, to finish my, my, my uh, thing with, by, uh, by stating of the six pillars of renewing Indo-Pacific security cooperation. I think the first pillar is finding areas of intersectionality between the coalition of the willing countries, uh, with, uh, new policy, and the coalition of the non-willing countries, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific vision. This is, has to be the, the, the homework number one. A second is advanced cooperation of a new frontier policy areas, which is uh, next generation telecommunication security. Third is coordinating on value-based diplomacy, emphasizing on combating foreign influence of operations, which is developing norms and in cybersecurity as well. And security cooperation focusing on asymmetric capabilities, this is managing tension through active alliances innovation base. Well, we cannot call it alliances here, but maybe uh, uh, we better call it security cooperations on the on the on the region, not uh, not alliances. And then uh, the final one is reducing barriers to the flow of capital, data, and talent with, uh, between the Indo-Pacific country. I like to close my uh, statement by saying that the way to get started is to quit the talking and begin the doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Connie, for that wonderful. Uh... Statement and I think uh, the big takeaway, the point we were making is of balance. Uh, Indonesia is Indonesia is the center of Indo-Pacific. Indonesia needs to balance in a real realistic sense, in a practical sense, uh, the conflicting forces, uh, two two blocks, if you will. Um, she said the coalition of the willing and unwilling people who don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> Uh, talking about that and uh, for them it is a real real issue and I would say that um, uh, the two points of contention Indonesia has is uh, the Indonesia uh, ASEAN view if I'm not mistaken which is that hey ASEAN is is good it's uh, uh, regardless of mr. what mr. Rimele will say it is uh, doing better than uh, than uh, EU it's definitely doing better than NAFTA. It is a success story. Uh, it is also the biggest, China's biggest trading partner, replacing the US. So, and they do, they go about their work happily. They look for consensus. They don't have strife among themselves normally. Um, so, so why why should we place our 
eggs in any other basket. Uh, we already have a, a thing. What is what is uh, Indo-Pacific going to do for us, uh, except give us more grief? Secondly, uh, national aspiration of Indonesians, uh, they've always been from the days of, uh, if I remember from President Sukarno's days, when I was not around, I'm not that old, uh, when Confrontasi and all was there, when they actually decided to rename the Indian Ocean as the <laughs> Indonesian Ocean. <laughs> This is President Sukarno's very great team. Um, and they are, they are very central to that ocean. They have the choke points, Malacca is beside them, and they have Lombok and uh, Sunda's face. So they have the, uh, the central position. So what is in it for them? So this is a very big uh, uh, issue for them, I think. And um, we want to come back to you, uh, uh, Dr. Becker, and then we'll come back to the Remley and then to uh, Dr. Bakwe, um, they are, I think when you said, you know, you, the Americans always stress on continuity, but I think China is a continuity of, uh, you know, they see long range. The Americans, in fact, have changed from Indo-Pacific to Pivot to Asia to, to uh, now the Indo-Pacific in, uh, in one generation, in one, uh, like, you know, in few years time. And people get confused. People want to see a long-term view of life and so when you talk about uh, uh, Fukuyama and we can also talk about Huntington they gave a uh, way forward and um, it has not gone along with that uh, the Chinese way is uh, more practical so this is what I want to uh, put forward to you that and that is the Western thinking um, I don't know whether Mr. Remley will subscribe that uh, although China aspires for, for domination of the world, they have not presented, and we are part of humanity, have not presented other aspects of humanity, which is um, uh, a universal acceptance of a code of values, um, which after Second World War, they were, and it was loosely termed uh, Judeo-Christian uh, uh, civilizational values. So is that the edge which you can present, or is there something we have to look for? Dr. Becker. Well, thanks for that. And and thank you to Dr. Bakri for to the extremely comprehensive and very informative uh, uh, talk. Your point about the, the the US sort of change between the Asia Pacific to the Indo-Pacific, I think is is a very good one. Uh, obviously the United States was was sort of late in terms of adopting the Indo-Pacific as a as a conceptual design for a broader Indian Ocean and, and Asia, East Asia region that's sort of a, a more unified approach. Um, but I think now, obviously, uh, Australia, Japan, and of course, India were, were further ahead in that regard than the United States. However, now I think that regardless of the terminology and maybe some changes around the edges of the conceptual design of the Indo-Pacific, we've seen starting with the Obama administration, a shift to a growing importance of the Indo-Pacific, however we want to call it, but the Indian Ocean and, and the Asia Pacific, now I think it's entrenched as the Indo-Pacific. We've seen a growing recognition of the importance of this region. And I think that there has been some continuity in terms of that importance from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. And I expect to see that into the Biden administration as well. My, my one concern is that obviously the United States as a global power has global interests everywhere. And it can be very, it, 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 it's, a, it's a concern always that the United States will be, uh, attention will be drifted away to another region, be it the Middle East or elsewhere. Um, I think that the recognition of that concern is, 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 is widespread in Washington. And I think that there's an understanding that in terms of the future of the United States, I think national defense strategy and other uh, documents, you, government documents that talk about the Indo-Pacific being the most consequential region for the United States' future, I think that does resonate with much of the sort of policy community in, in Washington, D.C. So I'm, I'm relatively confident that we're going to see a continued sort of focus on the uh, Indo-Pacific as opposed to other regions in U.S. foreign policy. Um, I thought that Dr. Bakri's point about the rise of China as a maritime power was a, a very important point. And I think it's, it's, it's remarkable the transformation that we've seen 
in the Chinese Maritime Forces, the People's Liberation Army Navy, the PLA Navy, to go from a green water to a brown water to a blue water navy in such a short period of time. And and what the Chinese, and, and it's, it's, it's one part and parcel with the rise of China as a as a economic power, and it really has been sort of a, 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 an economic miracle. Um, I've also seen that Chinese the P, Chinese maritime power and the PLA Navy has and and the PLA more broadly has played a role in providing stability and security in the world. And we've seen China's participation in in UN uh, peacekeeping operations. We've seen China participate in Gulf of Aden counter piracy operations. Those things are contributions to peace and security and, and, and the global commons, and I think they should be acknowledged as such. The concern, however, is it appears to me and, and, and perhaps to others that we see attempts by the PRC to undermine this understanding of a global uh, rule of law based on, on, on a, on a uh, multilateral rule of law in which all countries are treated equally under that law as opposed to sort of a bilateral system where China interacts bilaterally with with each country and I think we've seen that to a certain extent in the way in which China interacts uh, with countries in ASEAN and I think that's that's been of, of concern I think that some of the points that dr. Bakri makes about um, the importance of uh, reinvesting in technology and and concerns about uh, logistics systems and, and uh, logistics supply chains throughout the Indo-Pacific. These concerns for the United States, I think they're completely valid. Um, the, the idea about China's investment in global port infrastructure is one that I've, I've spoken about before, and I think that's, that's a valid concern. One point that, just as a source of optimism, I think that one point in the favor of the United States and its partners and allies that shouldn't be discounted is the vast array and the vast network that the United States has in terms of like-minded partners and allies that it works with and that it's developed with developed over a significantly long period of time. And to be fair, I think that those some of those partnerships have deteriorated over the past few years. And I think one of the challenges of the new administration will be to reinvigorate those relationships. So I think that that is that those will be some of the challenges that we'll see the new administration have to take on. Thank you, uh, Dr. Becker. Before I come to Mr. Premier, um, I just want to put forward to you that what the Chinese, if I'm not mistaken, offer, offer to ASEAN um, is uh, investment, and uh, what the Americans are offering is security, uh, defense security. Now in COVID, the equations have changed. And it's not an equal battle anymore. People want investment. People want economic recovery more than security um, for their own domestic harmony. So this is the new uh, post-COVID or mid-COVID world. Uh, so that is something which um, America cannot compete with, I believe, they are rivals. Uh, Mr. Remley, your views from Europe. Thank you. Let's combine. Somebody needs to secure the investment, and we have to. <laughs> Uh, first, first of all, let me welcome uh, uh, the. But this is because I haven't been there at the beginning. Welcome Jeffrey, then Ibu Koni, Salamat Tatang, Sekali Lagi, then. So, I think I, I might disappoint you first that I will continue talking now, not go into action. But I didn't find a virtual way of doing action now in this thing, so I will continue talking. <laughs> Both of you, and let me first come what Jeffrey said, had uh, very important points. I think since you, you, Jeffrey mentioned that since about 10 years, there is a shift in policy towards China from the US side, regardless of what administration. We also had the other side, beginning with the ping pong policy of, of, of Nixon. Uh, we had this drive to accommodate China to sort of with the belief once they are more prosperous, more wealthy, they will become more democratic in simple words. The US helped them to get into the WTO, uh, but all of them has not realized. And when that was seen, I think that is when the shift uh, slowly started uh, within the US administration. You also mentioned that the China wants to have a big Navy and wants to have a big naval power. Correct. 
They're not there yet, but let's look in 10, 15 years and we will see that. And that cannot be stopped. I think that will happen. So uh, from uh, that perspective uh, and going to what Ipu Kony also said, there is a historic perspective. I think when you mentioned historically the Chinese were there, yes, in their point, they were there everywhere with their famous Admiral Cheng uh, He about 500 years ago touching Indonesia and the Indian subcontinent. It's already in, in the collective memory somehow that the Navy needs to be that powerful to be everywhere again. That is part of, of the history. Now we should not look so much into the constraints, but more into the opportunities. And I totally agree with Jeffrey when he said we should look at the new opportunities. And uh, that needs to look at where are the interests of the states, where are the common interests of the states. And I think that is the process uh, what has been started with the first step, I think already done, Jeffrey, shared understanding that is increasing more and more. I witnessed in the last three years when I was in India, more activities, let's say with the US Navy and the Indian side with the events they had, uh, with the, not only talking of the exercises formally, but just this process of talking, increasing the different understanding. And then you come easily, of course, with developing a common understanding to the second, second step of having increased operational ability. You see, hey, what, what could we do together better than what we do alone? And automatically, but that is a more difficult and higher level to reach than the expanding maritime uh, domain. And there comes another point you mentioned, the competition between the US and the China will remain, not only with them, the competition among others also. But it's not only an economic competition. It is also not only a competition for power and for influence, it is also a competition, Ibu Kony brought in good governance. So under what governance do people want to be governed in the Indo-Pacific region? That question arises as well. And uh, that's why we don't have only an economic competition, but we have a competition of systems increasingly. Uh, China, of course, believing that their own system is the better one. And, and now I come back to a coalition of the willing ones, the maritime willing ones, or the like-minded ones. They do have a different approach in how governance should happen with a pluralistic approach, rules-based, democratically, and, and that is where the like-minded should maybe find more together. And that is the process I notice of what is working. And now comes the action. What can we do more? Because the first stadium of have a better understanding of each other has been achieved. Now comes the other parts. Okay. Uh, thank you, Babedar. I think you are really bring something that we don't uh, dare to discuss, uh, that actually China is going to bring a system as well. <laughs> this has become a very big uh, question because uh, maybe democracy is on the on the big test uh, lately. I mean, this, uh, we, uh, that we see what happening, especially in Indonesia, when everything has to be discussed, you know, everything has to be really under uh, uh, what's called democracy, which is actually is going nowhere. And it's so far to, to decide something. Uh, okay, but back to the China. Uh, maybe this is the first time I really look China with a very different perspective. For South China Sea issue, for example, when they claim about the maritime, uh, the maritime historical claim, I wonder why people get angry about it. I mean, when they claim about the historical claim, why don't we start from a historical claim as well? This is going to be crazy or maybe funny for some people, but for me it's not funny. Because why? Because if China actually built the NAFAL and the, the, the NAFAL and economic power since the 400 BC, and you are, and Mr. Manohara mentioned about Cheng Ho, Cheng Ho is on the 14th century. So meaning like it's already in centuries they run this kind of things. Now talking about Indonesia, Indonesia is a very uh, big, the uh, maritime power as well. Sriwijaya is 1,000 years. Majapahit is 800 years. So today, sitting here, and I'm watching about this, uh, this all this data about the competition between the US, between the United States, and then the US invite Quad. They they leave Indonesia behind. Actually, it should put the e Quad instead of only Quad, you know, because we hold the, 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 the sea line of communications here. But again, 
it's become is is for me. I like to be realistic. I mean, our defense budget is only one percent from the GDP compared with China, which is now is where are we going to be uh, 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 more advanced than the United States. What what can we do? That's why I I really emphasizing on the doing instead of talking, Mr. Papetel, because you know I think ASEAN political security like has to be really uh am uh going to the technical level instead of, of meetings uh over meetings and meetings for me i saw it like this uh political security like security lack of asean or we call it pillar it's like the uh, high hanging fruit that people doesn't want to talk about which is actually by the very limited defense budget indonesia could or should work together with asean countries to really uh uh, uh facing this uh this threat or maybe going to be attacked uh and really uh talking about the vision that built principles by the us like a freedom of the sea and sky now let me talking about the meaning of the freedom of the sea uh china capability on 2010 is already brown water navy they finished with the brown water navy projects this year they finished with the green water navy meaning what i study my war college in fushinkang war college in taiwan so i really know exactly by the meaning of green water navy their navy would be already under Java Island. So it's starting in the ocean, but near Java Islands. By 2050, they are going to finish the Blue Water Navy on 2050. But today, uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Baker, you forgot to, to mention that actually they are already on the southern part. You know, or, or, or the, or they are preparing the, their navy uh, with, the, with the name of Reset uh, and Science far more to Indian Oceans down there. So what they are planning on 2050, they already started here. About the skies, look what the China did on the on the East China Sea. The air defense advisory zone is competing between Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and everything. In South China Sea, of course, they will do the same because how come today a Navy without the protection of the of the of the of the, of the uh, air power? So. ASEAN could not wait and wait and wait until the edges of China will be implemented or South China Sea. So then I really emphasizing on the pillar of security like of ASEAN. I want something to be doing instead of talking because otherwise we are going to face a problem on the sea, on the maritime aspect of South China Sea, as well on the skies, on the outer space as well. And that's why I really, I really, <laughs> Papeta, maybe you don't like it about the saying like we better doing it. Because I think ASEAN political security, like I became the speaker of it since what, uh, maybe seven years ago, <laughs> and it's not, it's not, it's not really into something that we can really bind our our uh, our togetherness as ASEAN. And again, because we cannot compete with those how much uh, uh, or how far the navy power is, we are not like Pak Mohanoharan said during Pasukarno, we are going to change ocean, uh, Indian Ocean to Indonesian <laughs> Ocean. <laughs> Because we are strengthened in the southern hemisphere, that time we are the the, the strongest uh, 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 armed forces in the southern hemisphere. That's why President Sukarno just need to call President Kennedy, and Kennedy said, "Okay, uh, the Papua." Then you talk about it. You know, you don't have to fight. Well, I really believe on the power of military. That's why I took my defense studies very very hard, because I don't think economics enough. Our economy need, uh, need a very uh, a, a, a military power which is interfering between the economy and military. And therefore, in this forum, I really hope that maybe the Quad cannot invite Indonesia to get in. But perhaps the Indo-Pacific countries, especially ASEAN, will work to hand to hand uh, together, at least on, on, on securing the maritime and airspace. We really need to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh uh, uh Connie, uh, this is something uh, which I was also thinking about. Um, would you say uh, that Indonesia, uh, during the time when I was based in Indonesia, um, uh, uh, President Suharto was there, a general, he brought in a new order, Baru, uh, the new order, and uh, it was, uh, and he was called the father of development. They laid wonderful roads, telecom, the infrastructure, um, and there was a stability, uh, harmony, which was ensured by uh, the dual function, the dual function of the armed forces, which you know had also a social and political aspect to it. Now, if you look um, at uh, and uh, Mr. Dr. Becker, you'd appreciate that when you see the development of uh, South Korea, Japan, both developed with the security that that uh, 
that uh, US provided them. And so they didn't have to bother so much. India uh, is 2.4% of the GDP is on military. That's almost more than double the Indonesian's uh, percentage to GDP. So this is uh, the success uh, of a military uh, uh, approach. But I think in 21st century, I know Ibu Kony is a bit younger and same with Beck. But I think with Mr. Remley, we represent a generation which a little bit overlook these things. But the younger ones, you know, uh, younger generation, the millennials, for them it is important value, value-based uh, governance, um, you know. So is there a, uh, what do you feel about that, that aspect? I would like all three of you to comment on that. Uh, Peter, you first. <laughs> okay. Then, you know, the younger people always feel, and we notice that in our other events as well, they want to participate. They want to be part of shaping the future and not only being governed, but be part of the process, having their opinion in. That is sometimes very difficult, specifically in Asia, where the principle of senatority and um, high level experience is very often governing also and leaves the younger ones a little bit out. I think the aspect of governance is very important and uh, that's why it needs to be also maybe a bit more focused on. And that applies also to the governance in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, we have the UNCLOS, what is basically the regulatory framework for it, and it's further developed. So that's another point I would say how governance can be achieved by in the further development of the UNCLOS and its regulatory framework on the UN level that those states who have this common understanding developed in step one may also work together on that level to have the future of the regulatory framework of free and open oceans. This is not a new concept. It goes back to Hugo Grotius and the Mare Liberum and, 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 and to keep it up, yeah, to keep it up and not have um, the more powerful bringing things into a different direction. So that is what I would say why governance is important and uh, how it should even on that UN level be focused on by the like-minded ones who are also um, the coalition of willing in supporting the UN uh, regulatory framework. Coalition of willing. It's a bit, uh, I think, uh, we can give it a positive context. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we knew about the coalition of the willing during the Iraq war. And now uh, Mr. Rimley has taken, taken that thing to heart and he is now popularizing it. But I just feel that, uh, for instance, you brought up UNCLOS. UNCLOS uh, was put to the test in South China Sea. It went to the International Court of Arbitration. And when its finding was there, you think the people who were pointed out uh, agreed with it? They didn't. They just said, so what? And went ahead. And then what did our generation, this is my view about generational attitude. Our generation is OK. China has rejected it. So let's move on. Let's, let's talk again and negotiate. I feel that the next generation, it will not be so accommodating. They want, uh, they are more, uh, Faithful to principles, Dr. Becker. I think you have a very valid point, uh, and I think that I, I would agree with Mr. Rimmel's point about the importance of the sort of the, the 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 international governance system and the importance of a system and the, the as Dr. Bakri said the the competition between those systems. I, I would I would agree that I, I think sort of a younger generation is focused on the, the quality of those systems, perhaps. And I think this is where you see the interaction and the, the, the interplay between economics and security, because that global system is important. It, it, the, the importance of the establishment of that system is, is, is critical. And we have a system that's been established that treats all countries equal under the rule of law. But in my opinion, I, I think perhaps Dr. Bakri and, and her, her focus on security would agree is that it's it has to be defended, and and I think that's where you see the interplay between economics and security. I, I completely agree with Dr. Bakri's point about the PLA Navy being a blue water navy. Absolutely, uh, they're able to operate everywhere in the world, from the Indo Pacific to to South America, and I, I've seen it firsthand um, in in some of the exercises in which they participated. Um, I, I, I remember very distinctly, however, talking with some of my counterparts in Southeast Asia who make the point that 
it's very important and it's very it's it's all good and well that the United States has carrier strike groups in Southeast Asia, but if we're not there economically, then it's it, then it's it's lacking. It's not a hundred percent, and so I think both need to be there: the economic engagement, as well as the security protection and the security guarantees associated with that international system. And I think that's where you bring in the um, co coalition, if we want to use that term, of, of like-minded democracies and like-minded nations who are willing to stand up for that system that treats all countries free and fairly under a rule of law and shared international norms. Uh, thank you, Dr. Becker. Um, over to you. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, even even for America, uh, reeling from the COVID uh, and the economic uh, distress, um, how much can it allot to building the, the military power to assure security? Is it Can it match the Chinese? So this is also an important concept. And when it comes to people like uh, the countries like Indonesia, they're in complete dilemma, as uh, Connie ex expressed. Uh, Ibu Connie, that um, how how do you uh, go for someone if in in the very near future? I know Dr. Remley, uh, Mr. Remley said in 10, 15 years, China will be a great power in, to be dominating. It's there already. It is already dominating. And it can offer both investment and security. Then how do you compete with that? Ibu uh, Kony? I think, again, uh, somehow that's why I, I really don't don't uh, don't buy the words like expansionism of China or something like that. Because, because China is there, and then we, Indonesia, we cannot beat the military. To be honest, cannot. If something happens also China Sea, okay, we just pray. Dr. Baker, that's what we, we can do. We cannot do anything about it. And therefore, I think I like to be realistic. There's only two options for Indonesia to balance this this region. One, we should leave our non-alignment position. That's it. Finito. That's it. India. India is not alliance of United States, but really taking position very clear with the United States, with Japan, with Australia. They're building with uh, they're building the quad. But Indonesia. It seems like always in between. This non-alignment movement that we have today, I think is ended, ended up like we are no friend of anyone. We don't want to be with friend with you. We don't want to friend with uh, this as well, which is very hard uh, because we can we can do that with the second option. Then we go back to the Sukarno era when our uh, uh, defense budget revolutionary increasing more than 70, uh, 27, 29% GDP. 29% GDP and that time we become the, the, the strongest in the southern hemisphere. So I think we are facing a real uh, a real uh, fact, which is perhaps is not is not uh, comfortable to uh, for us to swallowing uh, swallowing it. But I like to be realistic. If China talking about historical claim, then we talk about historical claim. Then I'm going to bring all the maps out about the Sri Vijaya Empire up to the Vietnam and everything. Then we talk about about the history. Uh, but if talking about military, of course we cannot do it. I, I like to be realistic because even rural United States, which is the strongest, you know, the strongest armed forces in the world, I still believe it till up, the, up to this minute, they have alliances. They they, they change Australia Australia defense our doctrine for the uh, for the air force to the um, no I forgot the doctrine names but anyway change the doctrine of war of uh, ASEAN uh, uh, Australian uh, way of uh, war uh, 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 air, 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 air strikes and everything but Indonesia alone doesn't have coalition with anyone which is I don't like it but when I met uh, uh, Madran Albright in Bratislava she said to me that okay the coalition of the willing United States with the alliances full stop the rest of the world is coalition of the non willing so if we are not coalition or non willing, then who is our friends? China, Iran, who? I mean, we have to be very <laughs> or Russia. Again, we are very confused. We are very confused. That therefore, I think we just only have a very big challenges. We are we are, we really have to keep saying we are not alignment, but at the same time we are very weak to keep that one. So I don't know up to which limit we have to really uh, really change our attitude either change the 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 the, the vision of non-alignment or really daring to revolutionary change everything emphasizing to the military because today what i'm seeing about the rise of 
or US power, the rise of China power, and I saw uh, your uh, friends uh, submarine in, in, in Pacific Ocean, in Indian Ocean, because protecting their islands is, of course, shocking me. I mean, everybody's here. And how about us? That one is my answer. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Connie, uh, uh, the non-aligned uh, movement, much as uh, we uh, have great regard for it, um, it finished. It saw its flowering in uh, Bandung in 1959 in the Conference of Emerging Nations. And then uh, you had uh, Nasser and, uh, and uh, Nekrumah uh, and, uh, and uh, Nehru. Tito. Uh, we have Tito. Uh, Tito. And now they are gone, and uh, the Tito poor man is even his country is gone. <laughs> I mean, this is how <clears throat> how much the world has changed. So, what is it left in non-aligned? It, it yeah. has, there is not. It's not an existence. That is a good question, but you know, we treat the non-alignment movement as a Bible. We cannot change that. I I, I teach at the at the foreign uh, affairs school when I said that we have to erase non-alignment or maybe it's not fit to the century anymore. They are going to be mad because it's it's like saying I changed the Bible. You know, we we really have to stuck with it. So again, if we want to stuck with the non-alignment, I think then we left with one option only. We have to revolutionary change our our defense budget and our defense posture and capabilities, which is following what uh, President Jokowi mentioned on the 2014, become the real world uh, world maritime a uh, full crew power, which is. Not only maritime, we have to control, but of, of course the uh, the air and space as well. It's a big homework. <laughs> May I uh, put forward one, uh, and it has been highlighted by somebody who has joined us, uh, Asker Dusanov, who is talking about all this, and he was gently trying to point out uh, that uh, when you move from Asia Pacific concept to Indo Pacific you were neglecting large land masses and concentrating on large masses of sea. And we still live on the land and not on the sea. And he, <laughs> yes, and he's talking about his region, which is Central Asia, uh, Mr. Asker, do you know? Um, and what about Central Asia? And if you see uh, the Trump administration, it's a it's, um, highlight for its uh, military engagement was removal of American troops from Afghanistan, Central Asia, and yet, here is a system you're talking about which doesn't take into account Central Asia. Dr. Becker, would you like to answer that? That's, I mean, that, that's, that's a fair point. And, and Central Asia will continue to, to be important in U.S. foreign policy, obviously, in terms of uh, our role in Afghanistan and our engagement with Pakistan and elsewhere. Um, I think that this speaks to the question of how to maintain the focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific, because at least in my view, um, the fact that, yes, we, we, we live on the land and we live close to the sea and we travel via the sea and trade and commerce runs through the sea. Um, how, do we, how do we focus on those core issues without neglecting uh, areas like Central Asia and the importance of that? And I think Central Asia is just an entire, we, we could devote an entire panel to the issues of Central Asia, I think, um, and still and still only scratch the surface. But you're willing to ignore it? Ignore it? I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to ignore it. I don't think the Biden administration is going to ignore it. I think that their challenge is they're going to have to figure out how to um, allocate the resources in terms of time and focus on different areas to include Central Asia, the Middle East, and elsewhere. But at the same time, if they consider the Indo-Pacific to be the core domain and the most important area for the future of the United States, to acknowledge that in their policy. So there uh, you have it. Um, I, I don't know how many of you were there, and Dr. Mr. Rimley was there for the keynote address with the Chief of Defense Staff of India, and in which he talked about the importance of, uh, while acknowledging uh, the Quad and uh, and Indo-Pacific, obviously, um, he talked about strategic uh, autonomy. Can we satisfy Dr. Connie Bakri with that? Her nostalgia with, for the line. I think I'm better, better who answered that one. <laughs> strategic autonomy. <laughs> well, I like I like to 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 just uh, maybe. Um, 
saying something because you said that uh, about Central Asia. You know, Pak Manoharan, we are living on the globalization. Since we believe on the globalization, there there's no one we can left behind. Finish. We cannot leave behind anyone, any anyone, even even in the uh, well, Central Asia is, is 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 central. You know, even all the very 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 countries we cannot leave it. So there's no one can left behind, and therefore we really have to uh, to re really have a global common. Even though that one is very easy to state, but it's very easy to practice because somehow the world is divided by the coalition of the green and coalition of the non green things. Let's start from that one. I mean, if we can just reduce or erase that 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 uh, that uh, mental thinking of coalition of the willing versus coalition of the willing, which is I think I don't know wh wh where it start. Maybe because of, since uh, President Bush saying that we are with us or against us, something like that. So if I think uh, really uh, antithesis to the globalization, because globalization is saying something like we all together uh, have to uh, work hand in hand. So the other at the other uh, way of great leaders saying that we are with us or against us something like that so it's antithesis for what what we are really believe of the uh, dreaming of globalization i think that is my comment i mean another things economic well <laughs> we really have a, a very big homework but for indonesia with the indo-pacific uh, vision very very interesting pa, Dr. Manohara. If we are going to to really become uh, a, a strong, independent, uh, non-alignment countries, then this is going to be very sexy. Why? Because then we have to build our defense industry very massively. And of course, as I mentioned before, we are we can work together with the United States and coalition of the willing countries, which is European, NATO, and so on and so forth. But again, we can again build the the, the defense uh, industries with some other countries, which is cheaper and faster on giving the transfer of technology. And this is, I have to, to, to underline, because our uh, target today uh, with, with the president, uh, Jokowi, uh, since he's in the position since 2014, he really want to emphasize on the strengthening our defense industry. And strengthening defense of industry, I worked with my defense minister before, he sent me to, to Eastern Europe, he sent me here and there uh, to, to do the, the, uh, the transfer of technology and some, some, uh, to some our procurement. Again, it's very hard. Especially, we're not on the coalition or the willing side yet, Pak Baker. <laughs> so it's really, it's really confusing a position. But, uh, but uh, so in, interestingly, so today our defense industry product is should be a NATO uh, series number. So we are really playing a very confusing situation. We're not saying we are coalition or the willing, but we are taking part of that. So let's see what happens in the near future if we are. On the, on the on the confusing situation all the time then i'm afraid we are going to be only the watcher instead of player in this region and that one cannot be happen for indonesia actually thank you if you're, if you're talking thank you uh, dr bakri if you're talking about nato nato systems and procurement of it then um, as uh, dr becker has pointed out we uh, india cannot stand on the sidelines and that is where you either go on to for non-aligned yeah. or you go for a coalition and the signing of uh, found the foundational agreements between India and uh, and the US was uh, hinged on two things, Comcasa and uh, Becca. And that ensured the interoperability of systems of communication and uh, logistics. Now, old thinking, 20th century thinking was, uh, and uh, Dr. Becker, for some reason, uh, is not taking into account, though he knows very well that that boots on the ground, the armed forces, all that is 20th century thinking. 21st century, you fight wars with uh, drones, you fight wars with, with uh, other aspects of uh, missiles. And the core of it is the communications and logistics. This is how the wars are fought. So Becca and uh, Komkasa, to sign that, you cannot uh, be on the side of uh, non-aligned. This is my view. And uh, uh, Mr. Remley is about to say something. <laughs> yes, I would like to comment on strategic autonomy. It is nice and it's good if you can afford it. Uh, and I think very few countries will be able to put all in the military and cut. A, a state has many goals, social goals, other ones. And if you have lots of surplus in your budget, you can think about it. If you cannot, 
then I would come back to a quote of the Australian High Commissioner this morning. Then you need to know where your friends are. You can call them like-minded if you wish, uh, but that is the other thing. Then you make this coalition where you have maybe a um, certain weakness you cannot accommodate, but you try to find to address that within a partnership. And important in a partnership is, comes another element, trust. And that needs to be built up. And step one, what Jeffrey mentioned before, everybody's working on that, building up that trust that one can go on. So, of course, if I would be a military leader, my dream would also be to have strategic uh, independence uh, for my military. Um, if I look at any state, few will be able to achieve that. Um, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. I must uh, Mr. Ibrahim, I must point out to uh, Dr. Bakri and to Mr. Becker, uh, Dr. Becker, and to Mr. Emily that all three of you are in countries which do not have um, unfriendly forces at your doorstep. We are the only country. We are on the front line. You are not on the front line, and the South China Sea is not a front line for, for anybody. So this is the difference. So. When we, uh, so Dr. Bakri may be a little um, hasty in judging us having abandoned the uh, donor line because we have uh, the adversary on the border, on two borders. Beat that if you can. Is there any other country of size which has two adversaries on the border? We have to think otherwise. Dr. Connie? Okay, <laughs> um, I think what you said is right. But when, when you speak, I, re I realize something, you know, perhaps to build something like, uh, like Dr. Uh, Papeta said is buying uh, capabilities, which is very expensive, this and that is very hard. But you know, when I when I visit the Eastern Europe, they actually develop something very interesting. You know what, we, we have so many uh, uh, our procurement system created something that's very complicated. We have F-16 from America, we have Sukhoi from Russia, we have this and that from Embraer. And it's very complicated of talking about the modern war, which is the uh, natural centric warfare. But you know the very interesting things that maybe perhaps we, we, that we can build uh, this uh, capacity to, to join together with the ASEAN uh, security cooperation I mentioned before, is actually Maybe we have to produce something that actually the Eastern Europe doing it. They just make a little brain and we just need to put on all this uh, 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 materials. I mean, if you look into the submarines, into the ship, into the uh, fighters and everything. And then the network centric warfare could be uh, interconnected. So perhaps we we, we 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 cannot talk about something like big and huge thing like uh, like ships and everything, but we can start for something that we can do together. How about that? So it's going to be very interesting because anyway, our our war in the very near future is about the modern war. It's about the capability of natural scientific warfare. It's about capability of like you said, the UF is and everything has to be controlled. I think that's the the things that we can we can. I like to th to to discuss something that we can work together on. So it's not only by designing this and that it's not working, but something that really can help this this region to be peaceful and prosperity as as our dream. And then I think we have to start from the things that we can do. But uh, I I accept it, Dr. Koniva. Uh, uh, the checks, uh, as I know, I think both of you know, everyone, all three know. Uh, make excellent uh, small arms. They have a whole industry. The Czech small arms Thanks. industry is known. You know, right before, even before Second World War, they were there. Mm -hmm. They make, uh, they made good cars. And, you know, these guys were there before us. They not, they didn't start today. But I don't know. I mean, in a future war, faced with uh, hypersonic missiles and uh, high-level drones and and uh, huge uh, modern. Uh, jets and uh, um, anti-satellite missiles S small arms is not enough we have to have the technology to to counter that so this is our problem dr becker and that is why we need the americans <laughs> know where your friends are. Before, before <laughs> well, well, I would I would think that that the U.S. 
of course, the U.S. India relationship security has has moved ahead on that on that aspect of the relationship. But I I do think there are a number of other areas in the U.S. security relationship or the U.S. India relationship that that are gaining momentum. Um, I think that Mr. Manohar and your your point about India having two adversaries on its border is 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 a point well taken. I think that this idea about the coalition of the of the willing or 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 how the countries that are are willing to accept or in, ingratiate themselves into this the 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 international rule of law system, I think what we're going to eventually see is, of course, countries aren't going to agree on everything all the time. But what I think you're going to see is you're going to see a core group of countries that coalesce around a certain set of ideals and understanding of their ideal set of how the international system should operate. And then you're going to see countries that will cooperate in certain terms under certain conditions and, and other countries that will cooperate in other, other conditions. And I think that's that's perfectly natural that each country is going to um, operate and and work towards its own strategic interests. And I think this is even even true of China. I, I think that if the, the goal is not to contain China or to counter the rise of China, I think the goal is to integrate, is still to integrate China into a global system of governance. And I think that Mr. Rimmel's point about this ideal that China was going to democratize as GDP growth increased, um, economic development leads to democracy. This idea, I, obviously that's, that's there's, there's more complexity there. But China can't be ignored and, and it's going to be a core part of whatever international system that we have going forward. And I think that there needs to be a, a, a better way to integrate China into the existing system, which has served China well as, throughout the course of its development as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Becker, with that. Uh, Dr. Bakri, do you have any closing thoughts and Dr. Rimley? Uh, I don't think so. I think, I think everyone is exhausted. Again, Thank I, you hope, so I hope that uh, perhaps uh, I think because I join so so many uh, seminars and uh, things like this as everything is, it's always like we picture out to see China as our common enemy, which is I think is that right? Because again, as as a uh, as a neighboring country, I, I may call China our neighboring because of uh, the South China Sea uh, areas. We cannot do that, you know, especially with our our uh, position as a non-alignment. Right? When we, we keep saying that for I don't know for for how many years from now, uh, then uh, maybe it's it's about time that uh, some uh, powerful countries allow us to do something in our way which is something like perhaps the historical claim is a good thing that we can start of our historical guys to work together, sit together. And then we know that actually we are very interconnected between Indians, our ancestor coming from India, I believe. So everything's that, uh, the, so let the history bind us as a, as a Indo-Pacific uh, uh, nations, then uh, instead of keep you know, the keep the spirit of competing this military and the economic balance uh, all together. Because again, with our positions, with our historical, I think we have to believe that we really have to balance the shifting. And it's very hard to become uh, a, a, a balancing nation if we don't have that capability of military. Again, I always say that, the, 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 that we need a stick instead of all the cannon. Um. Thank you, and I just want to close with this thought that uh, the the concept of Pan Shield, which was the underlying underpinning concept when India and China were in good relationship pre-1962, it was the Pan Shield, this is a Sanskrit word going five principles, which Indonesia has as its natural uh, national uh, ideology. And one of the uh, things was peaceful coexistence. So I think that is a very good way to go about it. Would you agree, Connie? You, Connie? Yes. <laughs> Panchila. Panchasila. 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 <laughs> Panch. Panch. <laughs> Not Panch. <laughs> Panch. <laughs> Panch. 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 Thank you very much again, uh, Ibu Connie. Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Becker for getting up so early in Washington, D.C. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, Dr. Becker. <laughs>